Hi everyone, this is the Tutu Baba from Nightlight Astrology, and today I have my wife Ashley with me, and we're going to talk about planets and plants together. Hi everyone, it's nice to be here. Awesome. So uh, Ashley came on a little while ago, and we talked about planets and plants, and we're going to try to make it more of a regular thing. It was our intention to do so before everything started changing with the coronavirus, and social distancing started becoming a big deal, and um, we haven't had childcare, so it's been really hard to coordinate a time. See, this is a bit of an experiment because our kids are taking their nap right now. So <laughs> we'll see how if we can get through it or not. We're crossing our fingers. Um, in the meantime, uh, I just want to give a little bit of background. Um, so I've been a professional astrologer for like 10 years. My wife has actually been a professional herbalist for even longer than that. Maybe you could just tell everyone a little bit about um, you know, just like a brief overview of, you know, how you got into herbs and how long you've been practicing and your experience. Sure. Yeah. So I've, I mean, I've always loved plants. I was one of those kids that was always outdoors. Um, so I just, I think I pursued my love of nature um, and started studying environmental science um, within my undergrad studies. And then uh, right after that, I went on to um, start to study clinical herbal medicine. Um, so I would say I've been really a student of the herbs for about 25 years, but really like actively studying clinical herbalism um, since about 2003. Right. Yeah. And um, so it's interesting because in ancient astrology, of course, uh, herbal medicine and medicine, study of medicine in general was intimately connected to the practice of astrology. The two were inseparable really from the dawn of astrology. In fact, one of the ancient um, places of a, sort of a, an island, a Mediterranean island where um, astrology was being taught, one of the earliest astrological academies um, was right next door basically to a, a famous institute of um, herbal medicine. So they, they have a long history of being involved with one another. What we just want to do today is give you guys a brief, um, like a brief overview of how my wife and I have worked together in the past with clients so that you can see kind of a cool demonstration of how astrology and herbs can work in, in, uh, and complement one another. So we're going to take a look at a birth chart today, and we're going to break it down into a really simple pattern that this person is dealing with in their body. It's a mind-body connection always, but we're going to look at how this pattern that they've dealt with in their life manifested, and then um, with their permission, of course, and then um, my wife is going to talk a little bit about some of the herbs that might match up and be good allies for this individual, given what they're struggling with. Um, and really, the way that we've worked in the past, I mean, tell me if you think that this is accurate, um, is that we sit down with people and basically... I'm sort of the chart decoder. And as I'm decoding the chart, you're naturally um, picking up on the patterns that would be best matched with plants. Do I, is that a, a good way of describing it? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, I took your year one astrology the first six months uh, several years ago. And um, so, yeah, I think, you know, I, I know the basics of the patterns of astrology. So, yeah, I just sort of look at the themes and using my limited knowledge of the planets and um, what they represent and then thinking really mostly about the the temperaments and the elements and that's what I am listening for is what are the key words in terms of um, temperature and moisture levels and all of those things to help me kind of get a sense of what's going on um, within the person. It's accurate to say that that's sometimes referred to as the the energetics the sort of the energetic signatures um, that the astrology is keying us into is that right? That's right. Yeah. So looking at like, you know, the, the four main elements and then also, um, you know, are they fixed? Are they cardinal? Are they mutable? Right. Cool. So, okay. So we're going to take a look at a chart today. This chart we're going to call G and uh, G was nice enough to share her, um, her, her birth chart with us. So um, we're going to take a look at a pattern that is in her chart. Now, first of all, I just want to illustrate, again, I teach ancient astrology, and one of the benefits of ancient astrology is that it is um, much more of a predictive kind of karmic analytics. So when we look at a chart, the way that we gather information in a chart, we're really trying to determine, you know, what are the key factors here that are really going to have a big impact on a person's life? One of the things that we see um, right away in this chart is um, that we have Mars uh, right here in the first house. And it's a debilitated Mars in Libra, which is not the most comfortable place for Mars. And then we have it in an opposition to Saturn. Saturn is the malefic contrary to the sect. It's a nighttime chart and Saturn is in its fall um, in the seventh house. So a pretty, like, as we'd say, it's a jacked up Mars and it's a jacked up Saturn. And they're opposing one another, which is the 
perhaps the most difficult aspect in astrology, Saturn or um, oppositions were of the nature of Saturn. So um, when I look at this, I say, you know what, this probably has something to do with this person's father and this person's relationships. Why? Because Saturn is the ruler of the fourth house of father in this chart, where we see a congregation of planets all in Capricorn, Saturn's sign, which makes that Saturn the dispositor of a loaded house that has a lot to do with one's father. So I know this has something to do with dad, but I know it's also going to impact the person's relationships or social life because we see that Saturn's in the seventh house, which is a place of both social intercourse as well as sexuality, romance, marriage, and so forth. Now I look at Mars in the first house um, as the ruler of the seventh, a social house in the first house. You think to yourself, this is the person's house of personality and how they carry themselves in the world. And it's a little bit afflicted by Mars. It's also a little bit afflicted by um, you could say um, Mars's relationship with social life. So this is really interesting. You're just starting to put pieces together at the beginning. Um, and where we go from here um, is to formulate some possible examples of what, you know, what could have occurred in this person's life or what will occur in this person's life that could shape them. Probably their relationships in particular stemming from something that happened with their dad or some way that their dad was. And what you're going to look for in particular with, Saturn opposite Mars across the first and seventh house axis like this, and it's such a tight opposition too within one degree, is the person is going to try to embody Mars, right? So strength, power, force, conviction, aggression, assertiveness, but it's opposite Saturn, a limiting or oppressing force in the house of relationships, possibly related to their father. Um, I also noted just as a side story that peripherally the moon in its fall in the second house which is the place of money and finances um, and is a sign related to the family, the home, uh, the mother, sometimes the family background is also tied into this by virtue of being in Mars's sign in the second house of money. So that moon is relating back to this Mars Saturn opposition as well, interestingly enough. Okay, so that's the technical explanation. Those are some of the notes that I had jotted down before speaking with G. I asked her, you know, what was up? Tell me about dad. Tell me about how your relationship with dad has impacted your life, maybe your relationships or your social life in particular. But when she was 12 years old, her dad died of a heart attack. And at that point in time, she basically lost her best friend because she was bullied at school and having a really hard time sticking up for herself and being strong, like that Mars in the first house that we talked about. Um, her dad was her best friend and someone that helped her build confidence. After he died of a heart attack, um, not only did um, her social confidence, uh, was it challenged a lot more and she had to face a higher degree of, you know, let's just call it social difficulties because she didn't have that confidence boosting support of her father there. Um, but also her father was, um, you know, pretty wealthy and was a business owner. And after he passed, they lost all of their income and all of their money. So you see the moon and its fall in the second house of finances is closely tied in. One of the themes of her life that we talked about in the session to summarize it briefly, and then we're going to turn over to the herbal part, is that she's trying to build confidence in herself, being self-sufficient, um, being she has aspiration to be like her father, to have maybe have her own business, do her own work, and to be self-sufficient and strong. But she's always struggled with um, her both her relationships and her social life in general, uh, especially a lack of confidence and um, a feeling of being... Um, you know, just kind of held back and kept in check from expressing herself in the world in the way that she would like to out of mostly a sense of fear, but sometimes also a little inertia and depression. Um, so this is a, a story that, you know, first of all, just look at how amazing the, the technical piece of astrology is that we can predict something about her dad, impacting her relationships, impacting the family money. Um, this is so um, amazing that we can even do any of this. But here's the pattern that she struggles with when it comes to health. So in the session, and this is where my wife and I might typically work together with people in a session if we're doing planet and plant consults, um, we would look and we'd say, okay, so, you know, looking through all these different areas of life, she said, well, you know, it shows up for me really physically. And I said, well, how so? And she said, well, I tend to have a problem with heat. Um, the, the pattern that she described, it was like this. I tend to be really, really hot in my skin, in my cheeks, you know, sweating all the time. Um, and uh, it tends to get a lot worse if I'm with people, in which case not only will I continue to get really hot, but then I burn out. And I, after I burn out, I get really, really dry and depleted. So that's the basic pattern. Even when she's alone, she runs hot, but then social 
any kind of social situation amps the heat way up to the point where then she then gets really, really dry and sort of um, drained and really exhausted. She says she drinks water all the time, doesn't seem to make a huge amount of difference. Now, these are physical manifestations of the karma that is tied in, right? And she said this kind of pattern really started growing intensely after her father died as well. So, okay, now that's the chart. That's the pattern. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to my wife who is going to talk about what kind of herbs might go well to support someone who's dealing with something like that. Yeah, so the, the chart, I mean, it's really beautiful to see how it all is tied together. And, um, you know, just thinking about the energetics of Mars and heat and the energetics of Saturn and constriction um, and this sort of back and forth with the social anxiety and, and the sweating and the depletion, um, you know, the first place that my mind goes is um, how do we cool her nervous system down? How do we cool down... Um, her system in general. And so, you know, in um, herbal medicine, there are six tissue states. And um, to keep it very simple, um, the, the two that really apply to her would be excitation, where the whole system is in a state where there's a lot of activity and, um, yeah, sort of overcompensation in some ways. And the second one is atrophy, which is um, dryness and um, hardness, and that's kind of the Saturn. So the first herb that I think of for her is hibiscus. And hibiscus is a very cooling herb. Um, it's sweet. And so, you know, it's, um, it's in the mallow family. So it's sweet, it's um, slightly moistening, but it does have some tannins, so it's a little bit astringent. And that's why I like it for her, because um, because she has that pattern where she sweats and she has that you know um, nervous sweating, the tannins in in um, hibiscus are gonna just help help her hold the fluids in so that she doesn't dry out so quickly. But then there's some mucilage in there too, which is gonna give her a sense of feeling a little bit softer and more relaxed and help her tissues to hold to um, hold moisture to them. And um, yeah, hibiscus has been long used throughout tropical areas, um, you know, Jamaica is well known for hibiscus tea and, and South America. Um, so it's, it's one of those herbs that's often drunk, drunk in very hot climates to keep the overall body temperature cool. And it's also high in vitamin C. Um, and just, you know, thinking about how much, how depleting it is to be in that back and forth having social anxiety, you know, wanting to come out of yourself, but then having to feel like you have to maybe pull back a little bit um, can be really exhausting for the system. So just giving her nutritional support with the vitamin C, in addition to all of the other compounds in this plant that are really supportive. Um, and then the second herb I thought of was uh, marshmallow. Marshmallow is also in the same family. It's the Malvaceae or the Mallow family, same one as Hibiscus. And Marshmallow is um, very specifically, it's very cool and it's very moist. And it has this kind of slimy, sticky mucilage, which coats all the mucous membranes of the body that help the tissues to actually hold moisture. And so in just thinking about, you know, the, the parched mouth, you know, feeling dry on the inside, <clears throat> giving her an herb that is going to um, help her to actually hold moisture to the surface, you know, the internal surfaces of her body. And then another thing that's interesting too that I like about marshmallow is that it's what's called emollient. And emollient means softening. And so if I think about all that Saturn energy, it's really hard and kind of constrictive. Um, it creates tension. Uh, and an, emoll an emollient herb, what it does is it actually softens tissues and it softens tension. Um, so it can be really good for, you know, if there's patterns of tightness and holding, it can just slowly start to relax that tension and um, yeah, help break up. Uh, any hardness in the body or in the mind. So those would be the herbs that I think of. Yeah, those are great. And one of the things that came up, and I know we were talking about this prior to sitting down and recording when we were looking at our chart together was um, that one of your teachers, Matthew Wood, you mentioned says that sometimes we have to imagine that we're going back to the moment where the initial trauma of whatever the pattern might be um, began. And we're looking at, uh, you had said that he, he says, we're, we're looking at treating almost like what would you have given them at that time? Um, and 
I think about some of this in her chart. Let me just put it back up on the screen for just a second again. In her chart, you'll notice that um, you know we're we've got an elemental void. Uh, I've, uh, one of my friends, Jen Zart, is about to give a talk in the next week on elemental voids in the chart, which means when there's an element that's really sort of lacking. She's got um, you know she's got an air sign rising with Mars in the North Node in an air sign. She's got two planets in fire signs, three in Earth signs one in water, but see, Scorpio is a really deceptive water sign when it comes to counting your elements because it's Mars ruled. And if Mars in the chart is really dominant and angular, um, then, you know, in a sense that becomes almost like a fire element or like more like boiling water. Um, so it's going to feed into that Mars in her chart. And what you'll notice is that here's Cancer empty, here's Pisces empty. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's definitely like, you know, that the, the you could think about it like what happens to water when it's when it's heated up you know eventually it dries out so this is kind of it's she has water in her chart but it's being it's being hit by the the heat of mars underneath it so to speak so um you know it's being dried up a bit so i think that you you know it's really cool how you can see these patterns in a person's life and the way that they actually end up playing out in the body and then of course in ancient astrology what's really cool about all of this is that it would be these so let's just say that you know we pick a couple of herbs like my wife has has just done. But it would also be, and please, maybe you could speak to this. It would also be how we gather it, how we harvest it, when we do it. I mean, I know that we don't have to go into the details about the astrology of when and how you would do everything. But I mean, it was ritualistic and ceremonial and very personal, the way in which these things would be applied and, and gathered, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, tr yeah, traditionally, you know, you would look for certain, um, especially the moon, you know, when the moon is traveling through different signs, um, that would tell you a lot about when it's a good time to harvest specific plants. So that, um, yeah, I think that was something that people really paid attention to and also preparation, you know, different people elementally need different types of preparation. So, um, you know, in, in Culpepper's time, you know, in the 1400s, you know, there was a lot of herbal wines that were given or syrups um, alongside teas and, and alcoholic extracts. But, you know, there was a variety of different forms of giving the herbs that would also be very specific to the person you were working with. Right. Yeah, I think that's really neat. It's just cool for people to hear about that. Um, so um, that is, uh, I think we're going to, we're going to uh, try to keep it short and sweet today. Just wanted to give everyone a sample, but I just want to thank my wife again for being here. Um, thanks for for just helping us out and helping us learn some really cool things about, you know, how plants can actually be lined up um, to help us, um, you know, alleviate some of the suffering we're dealing with and just become allies for us as we're we're each you know working on our on ourselves spiritually. Yeah, totally. I'm I'm so glad to be here and happy to share what I can. Um, and yeah, it's, it's so fun to be able to work together and just to see how uh, really connected the plants and the planets really are. Yeah, totally. So G, thank you for letting us use your chart. Uh, we've got um, marshmallow and hibiscus and, um, you know, some recommendations on how to prepare that and use that. So um, we'll, we'll email her and we'll be in discussion. But I also want to um, promote my wife's uh, website. It's skyhouseherbs.com. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's a new website, so I'm getting used to it myself still. But yeah, skyhouseherbs.com. It is a brand new website. It's just about ready to launch. So if you get there and there's sort of, you know, there might be uh, still a holding page up when, by the time you see this, um, but it'll be up soon. And my wife, like myself, has been teaching apprenticeship programs for over a decade now. Um, so we will be running... Um, a special actually in the Kickstarter in the fall of this year where there's a pairing option. If people want to take the astrology program and the herbal program at the same time, you can get a discount. Uh, my wife teaches a one first year and second year herbal apprenticeship course that's online. Uh, there's a lot of cool things you can do if you're in the Maryland, DC, you know, um, Virginia sort of area um, that's in person too. Um, but uh, we, my wife loves to do herb walks and all sorts of cool stuff and also has a lot of cool services if you're looking to um, uh, find an, an herbal ally. So um, yeah, so check her, her stuff out. And uh, yeah, thanks again for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay. See you later, everyone. Bye.